Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining. We have so much to get to in this episode. First of all, we're going to be looking at what are the five most overvalued companies in the stock market. We know that things have been getting a little bit expensive. You see all the videos of stocks going up two times or three times in value. Well, a lot of them are becoming very pricey. In this episode, I'm going to be going over five of the most overvalued companies in the stock market. In addition to that, of course, we'll be looking at my personal portfolio, the passive income portfolio. It has been doing really well over the past months. So I'll be going over what I'm investing and what companies I'm buying because there is one company that I've continued to buy over the past week. In fact, I just invested about $6,000 into it. So I'll be going over my purchases. Now, on top of that, we have some news to get to. Apple has some rumors that they're building a car and it's going to be in production by 2024. This is going to be an electric vehicle with next level battery technology. That's what we're being told. Now, Apple hasn't confirmed this. They haven't denied it, but this is the rumor going on. We're going to take a look at this. We also have news that Fed did another big stress test on the banks and found that they're fine. In fact, the banks are in such a good situation right now that they can do share buybacks, which JP Morgan announced that they're doing $30 billion of share buybacks starting next year. So starting next year, JP Morgan is going to be buying their own shares. And just to give you an idea of how much $30 billion in share buybacks is, that's currently about 9% of their market cap. So they're going to be buying a substantial amount of their own company. Just because of this news, the stock bumped up about 5% in one day. So this was pretty big news. So we have a lot to get to. We also have questions and emails to get to. Before jumping into all of that, I do have to mention the Patreon. It helps support the channel. If you join now, it's a free trial until the end of the month. So you can join now risk-free, try it out. You get access to a community Discord. You get access to a dividend tracking website, as well as some exclusive episodes. So if you're interested in this, I'll leave a link to it in the description. Okay, so let's go over the five most overvalued companies in the stock market. And this is going to be according to the analysis firm Morningstar. So in number five, it might not surprise you, but we have Tesla. Currently, they say Tesla is so overvalued that it's trading at 112% premium, meaning that they believe it's over double its fair value. They think the fair value is $306 and it's currently trading at 640. Now they have a write-up going over the entire case of Tesla, but you can boil it down to a few things. First of all, the company has already ran up a tremendous amount. It's up 700 plus percent year to date, and it's at a market cap above $600 billion. That means that Tesla is worth almost as much as Alibaba, the Chinese e-commerce giant. It's worth more than TSM and Berkshire Hathaway and Visa. It's almost as valuable as Facebook. So Tesla's trading at a monstrous valuation, and part of this is the expectations baked into this stock. Investors are expecting Tesla to be the global leader in electric vehicles. If that story doesn't play out, this stock is going to get hurt. It'll get hurt very bad if other competitors come in and start taking a lot of market share from Tesla. So part of the risk with Tesla is the extraordinarily high expectations already baked into this market cap. $600 billion means that investors are expecting this company to be an extraordinarily profitable company. If that doesn't happen, if they lose market share, if they have anything go wrong with the company, then that market cap is coming back down. Now we can also look at another concern with Tesla. Investors just this year, year to date, have made tremendous returns with the company. It's up over 640%, nearly 700% returns in one year. That is really incredible. The issue is, can Tesla do that again? Well, if Tesla was able to get 700% returns again, let's say next year, that means the company would be worth about $4.2 trillion, which would make it worth roughly twice the market cap of Apple. And Apple has a net income of over $50 billion a year. So I think that's unlikely. In fact, I think that's impossible. I do not think that Tesla is ever going to have a year again where it goes up seven times in one year. That really would make it the most valuable company in the world by almost double. So I can't see investors ever getting the type of returns that they've had in the years prior. I think the future returns for Tesla are going to be much more tame. I think they'll be much lower than prior years. And unless Tesla really fulfills all of these high expectations, I think there's a lot of risk with this stock. And number four of the most overvalued companies in the stock market, we have Zoom. The video conferencing app, it's at a 132% premium according to Morningstar. So they think it's more overvalued than even Tesla. And they give it a high uncertainty rating, meaning that they think that the outcome of Zoom is highly unknown. When people invest in companies like Zoom, it's almost like a speculative bet. 
You're betting that the company will do really well, but the possible outcomes are very great. Zoom can either do fantastic, or it could really lose a lot of market share and it could do really poorly. If we look at the stock price of Zoom, you can see that it went up almost 700% and it started to trade down as soon as we got a lot of news that the economy might be reopening soon with the vaccines and different things like that. So Zoom is one of these companies that's really benefited from the pandemic. How it will do outside of that remains to be seen. In number three, we have Shopify, trading at a 141% premium. The fair value, they say, is $496, and it's currently trading at $1,277. So this company is trading at a very high valuation. Now, the biggest issue with Shopify, when people are talking about valuation, is that the market cap is $144 billion, and the revenue is about $2 billion. So you have a company that's revenuing about $2 billion, give or take, and their market cap is $144 billion, you don't see that that often. Most companies with a market cap above 100 billion are revenueing over 10 billion, and they're growing that revenue very fast. So Shopify is one of these companies that has very high expectations priced into it. It's been trading sideways, even though the company continues to have blowout reports. Every single quarterly report, they blow out all the numbers and they perform really well. But Shopify is one that they consider right now to be heavily overvalued. In number two, we have Netflix, and they have it at a 164% premium. That is a huge premium. They say that the fair value is $200 a share, and the last price of it was $530. So there's a huge disconnect here. I looked over their reasons for Netflix being overvalued, and they mentioned all the competitors. We got Disney moving in. We have HBO Max. We have NBC with Peacock. We have a lot of services like that, but I disagree with Morningstar here. I think that Netflix is trading at fair value. I look at a lot of different companies that all have around the same market cap, and Netflix has very good numbers and fundamentals. If I look at their revenue growth, Netflix has really good revenue growth. They're growing it year over year at around 30% a year, which is really good for a firm of that size. They also continually increase their operating margin. They're taking out less and less debt every single year, and they have extremely high retention rate with very low churn. So I see Netflix as one of the few companies that I think is worth the premium. There's a lot of analysis that people think that it's overvalued, but I look at a company that has 200 million subscribers and they grow that number every single quarter. I think in a few years down the road, Netflix will get up to 300 million subscribers. So this is a company that I actually disagree with Morningstar on. I think that Netflix is at a fine valuation right now. The number one most overvalued company in the stock market, according to Morningstar, is Square. And they have it at a 199% premium, meaning that they believe the fair value is around $78 a share, and it's currently trading around $240. So they believe it's severely overvalued. Now I've read through their analysis on this and I mostly disagree with them on this one as well. I think that Square is a pretty good company that's a fast growing FinTech company and it's gained a lot of market share. It's not really profitable by that much yet because they really haven't monetized many of their services. I do think that Square is overvalued but not to the extent that Morningstar is saying. Now, in my personal opinion, if I go to my finance companies and I look at which ones I'm betting on, I think that JP Morgan offers a much better risk reward. The company is not heavily overvalued by any measure. JP Morgan's trading at a very low valuation. Even year to date, it's in the red. So this is a company that has not run up with all of its fintech pairs. But JP Morgan is doing very well financially. They just announced that they're doing $30 billion in share buybacks. So they're buying back about 9% of their market cap. And on top of that, they pay a 3% dividend. So the overall yield of this company is very high. They do a lot of share buybacks. They do a lot of dividends. And on top of that, they're also competing with these fintech companies like Square. JP Morgan has built out a lot of small business solutions like the point of sale devices that Square offers. And they even have a lot of advantages over Square. So in my opinion, you can choose between Square or JP Morgan or invest in both of them. But I think that JP Morgan is more of a sure bet that I think will make a good amount of money. And I think that Square is more of a speculative bet. But either way, we'll see how this plays out over the next year. So there's my roundup of the five most overvalued companies in the stock market. Tesla, Zoom, Shopify, Netflix, and Square. Now, like I said, I do disagree on a couple of these valuations. I think that they're off. I don't think that Netflix is overvalued. I think that Square is not overvalued to this extent. And I think most of all, valuation is difficult. You can look at the analysis of different professionals. You can look at different YouTube videos. But when it comes down to it, what you're doing with valuation is you're trying to look into the future and project out how much money this company will make. And that is difficult to do. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of variables. 
you really don't know how much money a company will make, but we try to make the best bets we can. In my portfolio, I've been making a bet on JP Morgan. I think that there's a high probability of JP Morgan making a lot of money over the next three years. And I think that the current price of it offers a very low risk. So in my mind, I have a high opportunity to make some money and I have a very low opportunity of losing a lot of money. So that's a risk reward that I like. Another company that I've been buying a lot of is Disney. I now own $20,000 worth of Disney. That's 117 shares. I'm currently in the green by $3,000, but I've continued to buy this company because I see so much potential upside for it in so many different ways. I think that their parks will reopen soon enough. I think that they'll have their operating income return. I think that they'll have a big streaming service that might dethrone Netflix in the future. I really like the people leading their company. Jon Favreau putting together all the content for Star Wars in the Marvel movies. I think he's going to make some very compelling content that people are going to pay to see. So Disney, in my mind, offers another opportunity for a good risk reward. The company has a lot of potential upside, a lot of different growth paths, and I think the risk is pretty minimal. Once the parks reopen, they'll be a highly profitable business again. And I do think that Disney will continue to pay a dividend in the future. So with these recent purchases with Disney and JP Morgan, they become two of my biggest holdings. I still have Apple as the biggest holding. I currently have about $24,000 of Apple, about 7,500 as gains. And then we have Disney and JP Morgan in store capital. Over the past month, this portfolio has performed really well. It's gone up 5.78% which is $8,800. So that's a good one month performance. And at the same time, it's paying me dividends. I earn $330 in dividends. So this portfolio continues to give me a lot in capital appreciation, and it's paying me a stream of dividends at the same time. If you wanna see all the companies I'm invested in or look at any of these pies, I'll leave a link in the description with my current allocation. Now moving on, let's jump into some news. There's this rumor that Apple's making their own vehicle, their own electric vehicle, and it's gonna be in production by 2024. So that would actually be pretty soon. Here's Gene Munster, he's an Apple analyst that gives his opinion on whether he thinks this is real. I don't know if they'll have a car or some other play in the autonomous space, whether it's a software and a licensing model. I do believe that with the seven years of work that they've put into this, along with this massive addressable market that Josh outlined, this $2 trillion uh, uh, market, I do believe that the company is going to pursue and eventually have something there. So the timing of this is difficult to predict. The magnitude is measurable. Just one last thought on this, Tyler, is that this $2 trillion market Apple's revenue next year is probably going to be $315 billion. This is big enough for Apple to move the needle. So he says yes. He thinks that Apple is working on this. It's probably one of their goals. The size and market of an electric vehicle is so big that it will probably attract Apple's attention. And they're one of the few companies that actually has the resources to be able to work on a project this massive. Now he's also asked, what does this mean for traditional automakers or Tesla? And it is certainly trouble for traditional automakers. And Tesla, it's gonna be the tale of two stories. One is the fundamentals of the company, and second, the stock. I think it's gonna have two different reactions. Now, I certainly think there would be a reaction in the stock if Apple officially announced that they're gonna be competing with Tesla. I can't really imagine a bigger rivalry between Apple and Tesla if both of them were making EVs. Imagine the cult following between both of those companies kind of battling between each other. That'd be something that we haven't seen before. Now, we don't know too much information about this, except for the couple snippets in this Reuters reports where they have the insiders sharing this information. They say central to Apple's strategy is the new battery design that could radically reduce the cost of batteries and increase vehicles range according to a third person who has seen Apple's battery design. I keep hearing about these new battery designs, but I really haven't seen them yet. And I imagine if Apple is able to come up with some radical change in their batteries, they'd probably be using that in their phones and all of their devices, because that would give them an enormous lead over Samsung or different competitors. So I certainly don't see this new battery design being anywhere completed yet. They also aren't sure how Apple would go about the manufacturing or implementation of this. They say it remains unclear who would assemble an Apple branded car, but sources have said they expect the company to rely on manufacturing partner to build the vehicles. So they could partner with a different company. They say there's still a chance that Apple would decide to reduce their scope of its efforts to an autonomous driving system that would be integrated with a car made by a traditional automaker. So there's a bunch of different possibilities that Apple could be looking at. Right now, it's all just speculation. So that's the news we have right now about the Apple car. 
It's very much unconfirmed. There's a lot of speculation. The stock went up like 4% this morning and then it came down a little bit. Personally, I'm not running out and buying more Apple because of this news. I think it's too far out and I think it's a little early to be doing that. Next, we have really good news about US banks. They have passed another stress test. They've had two this year, which has never been done before. They were tested under two different hypothetical scenarios in which unemployment remains high and the economy doesn't bounce back for several quarters. They did one test where unemployment went up to 11% and stayed there for a very long time. And even in that scenario, banks were able to take on the amount of loan losses they would project. They said that they actually tested the banks against $600 billion in loan losses and they would still pass. So the banks are very well capitalized. Now, right after the results of this stress test, JP Morgan, along with many other banks, announced that they're going to be doing a lot of share buybacks. In fact, they announced $30 billion in share buybacks starting Q1 of 2021. So they're going to be doing this very early. My guess is that JP Morgan will be doing these purchases heavily early on because they want to get the best deals on their own shares. Now, with $30 billion in buybacks, a lot of people don't realize how much money that is that JP Morgan and other banks are buying back of their own stock. Here's a fund manager and CEO that invests heavily in these banks explaining the importance of this. It represents the fact that the banking industry has enough capital to get through this crisis. And our math suggests, and if our models are right, many banks can buy back 20% of their market cap at today's prices through the end of 2022. We think it's very significant. According to the models that he's put together, these banks can buy back roughly 20% of their market cap over the next two years. And I think that's accurate. JP Morgan announced $30 billion in buybacks. If they do the same in 2021, that'll be roughly 20% of their market cap over the next two years, which is an enormous amount of buybacks. In addition to that, JP Morgan should be raising their dividends once the Fed allows them to. So this is a company that's gonna be returning a lot of money back to investors. Now he's also asked about valuation. Does he think these banks are currently undervalued? And just about every valuation figure that we look at has, especially on a relative basis, still has the banks about 20 to 25% cheaper than I think they ought to be. Yeah, no, we're positive. I think a year from now, these stocks will be higher than they are today in my opinion. So he thinks on a relative basis, every valuation model they look at, they're 20 to 25% undervalued. I agree with that. I think that when you compare JP Morgan to a lot of their competitors, to the fintech companies, it's trading at a very low multiple, a very low valuation, considering the dividend yield, considering the buybacks, and considering the financial situation it's in. It's in a very good financial situation. So I agree with them. I think the banks should perform well over the next year, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay, let's get to some emails. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. If you want to email in your question, we can discuss any subject here. The first one is from Ryan. He says, hi, Joseph. Thank you for the awesome content you put out. I'm excited to see what you do next. Here's my question for you. Why do we so often hear that it's almost impossible to beat the market and that investors should just buy index funds instead of individual stocks? When it seems rather simple, if you research and buy great companies and hold them for several years and restrain from selling during downturns, it's not that hard to beat the S&P 500. Can you shed some light into this common sentiment? Best Ryan. Well, Ryan, I actually agree with the advice that the majority of people are probably not going to beat the S&P 500. I think that's true because the majority of people have really busy lives. They're working day jobs. They have families. They want to come home and not really do more work on analysis of companies. They want to come home and relax, you know, look at their phone, have entertainment, spend time with their family, watch movies. Not a lot of people are willing to put in actual time to look and think about companies, look at their quarterly reports, look at their revenue growth, you know, look at their level of debt, look at their subscribership count. Most people are not willing to put in the effort to actually look at good investments. And so if they do pick investments, it's done with very little effort. They just look at a company they like and they put some money in it. And that's the issue of, of the majority of people underperforming the S&P 500. For people that are actually real investors, people that do their research, they do the studying, they put in the homework, a lot of them are crushing the S&P 500. I have many people on my Discord that are absolutely crushing the S&P 500. They've invested in a lot of companies and technology that has far outperformed it. So I know firsthand that it's completely possible and many people do beat the S&P 500, but it's the people that are really, people that are studying this all the time, they're investing all the time, you know, they're really doing good research on companies and they're buying quality companies. If you're not willing to do that, 
it's probably better to just use ETFs. I really do think that's the solution for most people. If you're just starting off with investing, I'm about to do a beginner's video. So I'll have one on the secondary channel, the Joseph Carlson After Hours. If you don't know about that channel, I'll put a link in the description, but I'm gonna come out with a video that is for beginners. It's an investing for beginners channel. And I'll give you my recommendations in more depth of what I would do if you're just starting investing. The next one's from Ernie. He says, Joseph, I don't know if the article below is worthy of a segment, but I'd love to hear your opinion on this. All right, Ernie, I'll check out the article. Okay, it says, Boeing inappropriately coached pilots in the 737 MAX testing, Senate report says. Boeing officially inappropriately coached test pilots and violated proper protocols in the test of the key MCAS safety system tied to the jet's two fatal crashes. This doesn't shock me one bit, Ernie. This is exactly what I would expect from Boeing. A lot of people have pointed out, oh, I sold Boeing at the wrong time. I sold it when it was down. I get that. You can look at the company through an investment perspective and just say, I just want to maximize my return on Boeing, regardless of the situation, regardless of what the company's doing, regardless of the internal management of it. Boeing, to me, became such a frustrating company to read about, such a frustrating investment to have. The more I studied about the company, the more I looked into what they were actually doing, the more I became angered at how this company was managed. It made me not want to be an owner of it. I really did not want to be part owner of Boeing. They cut corners in every way possible on people's safety. They cut as many corners as possible to maximize returns, and it led to devastating outcomes. They did it with the amount of safety features they had. Did you know the MCAS system that caused this crash? They also sold a safety feature that was a software feature that would make it so it would warn pilots if the MCAS system was going off. But that was an additional paid for feature that only the very profitable airlines, like the US ones, were able to afford. So the more foreign airlines that didn't have as many profits, they couldn't afford the safety feature that would have completely prevented these crashes. So Boeing upsold like a, you know, it's like a app purchase in Fortnite, an important safety feature that could have saved 300 people's lives and Boeing as a company. But they charged this as an additional thing. And it wasn't like it cost Boeing a lot of money. This is a software feature. That's just one of the things they did. They also, after the first crash, didn't properly investigate the crash. They let their airline continue to fly these planes. They didn't want to take down any plane or do any proper investigation. And that wasn't where it ended. Even after the second crash, six months later, of the same type of plane in the same manner as the first one, guess what company wanted to keep their planes flying? Boeing. They wanted to keep the same 737 MAX in the air after two crashes within six months. It took Europe to say, hey, we're not flying this plane anymore. We don't care what you say about it anymore. And then finally, President Trump, after talking with Boeing, said, yeah, we have to take these planes down. But Boeing didn't want to. They wanted to keep it flying. This is the most egregious judgment that I've ever seen from a company. They, of course, now you're pointing out that they improperly trained pilots. I've read a lot more of that. They, they skipped corners on training. They skipped corners on, of course, the software. This was the most obvious test that they could do in the software to make it not repeat over and over again 22 different times, which led to these crashes. And then after this whole ordeal, after the two crashes, Boeing goes on to testify and blame the foreign pilots for their aviation skills, saying that U.S. pilots would have probably been able to save this, but it was the pilots' training that was at fault, which is totally not true. The pilots did their job. They were flying a death trap. Boeing's actions have been completely egregious. Their judgment has been absolutely dismal. People talk about judgment of a company, right? AT&T had poor judgment in some of their purchases, right? They purchased DirecTV at a bad time. Whoops, they wasted some money. That didn't kill anybody. Boeing is making incredibly poor judgment when their highest priority is people's safety. They have to have absolute trust flying with them. And Boeing has exercised the most poor judgment I can possibly think of. So no, right now, I don't want to be part owner of this company. I'm not interested in it. I really don't care about the future expected returns or if they give the dividend back or anything like that. The time I'll return as a shareholder to Boeing is if I think they've completely changed their internal management. If they change their judgment and their decision making, that's when I'll decide to buy back into Boeing. 
Isfren says, good morning, Joseph. I am one of your many subscribers. Great show and great content. I was subscribed to many investment channels this year, especially about dividend stocks. The notifications were annoying. At the end, I kept two or three. You are one of them. I appreciate being one of them. I try not to keep my notifications annoying because I only put out one video a week, so that shouldn't be too bad. Now, uh, you say, I've never heard you talking about e-currency, Bitcoin, CRO, Ethereum, etc. Being so thoughtful and curious person, what's your take on that? Are you investing some of your money in e-currency? Keep producing so good content. Well, I do not own any crypto whatsoever. I don't have a single coin of any kind. Now, I'm not really against crypto. My thoughts on it have evolved over time, like it does with many investments and many things that you can put your money in. But crypto started off as something that I think it was kind of a uh, like a tech hipster product that many tech nerds early on were obsessed with. And it was just this niche thing that the masses really haven't even heard of. It was mostly used, I think, at the beginning for illegal purchases of not good things. You're talking about the dark web and things that people don't want to be tracked purchasing. I don't like that aspect of it. I don't like that some people that held crypto because they wanted to use it for uh, illegal purposes, that they're being rewarded and they had made a lot of money because of the price going up. So I don't love that part about it. But I will say the technology is interesting. And I think the real value in crypto is not any type of intrinsic value. In and of itself, it's not really worth anything, but it's worth what other people are willing to pay for it. And I think that as it becomes more mainstream and more widely adopted by financial institutions, I think that the value of it will increase. So if companies like Robinhood offers crypto, we also have companies like PayPal starting to offer crypto. I think as many of the big banks like JP Morgan and others start to offer crypto, I think it will increase in value. As there's more and more wide scale adoption, I have to assume the value will increase. So I'm not against having crypto at all. I think having a small portion of your portfolio in it is not such a bad thing. But when I'm looking at where I want to put my money and I'm deciding between this speculative commodity that really isn't universally used right now, or companies that pay me out dividends every single quarter that I earn cash back for my investments, I'm just choosing what I think will produce value in and of itself. If everybody else sold out of JP Morgan or Store Capital, they're still going to pay me those dividends. They're still going to be profitable companies. If everybody sells out of crypto, you're in trouble because the only returns you own on crypto is other people buying it. That's the only way to make money. And I like assets where I can earn money through share buybacks or dividends. Andrew says, hello, Joseph. I am a longtime watcher and first time messenger. I am writing today to ask your opinion on my career path options. I am 24 and I just went back to college after a few years out due to my family situation. Before this semester, I was pretty unguided and I just took core classes and calc as I knew it would be useful down the line in getting me a degree. Now that I'm back, I switched over to computer science from general science with every credit transferring and I'm having a blast. I should have my associates next semester, then I will go on for a bachelor's. My question to you, what are the advantages and disadvantages to your job? And do you have any opinions on the jobs within computer science? I have a big decision of choosing an even more concentrated direction, so I wanna hear from people that are actively working in the field. What are the advantages and disadvantages of my job and how do my opinions on other jobs within computer science? Oh, well, the advantages of computer science jobs like programming are the high pay, the comfortable working situation. You're working indoors on a computer, sitting down. You're not doing backbreaking work. Um, you don't have to work with people that often. You're working with computers. I think that's an advantage because I don't have to deal with as many random people. If you work in some different related areas like IT and you're doing like help desk work and setting up computers and servers, you're going to be working a lot more directly with people. You're going to be solving their problems every single day. But with programming, you don't have to do that. And a lot of this stuff is considered an advantage or a disadvantage. Some people like moving around. Some people are very social. They like talking to people every single day. Programming is really not the job if you want to be interacting with people every day. There's other ones like marketing, sales, that you can do, you can do a more social aspect. So I think that there's a lot of advantages to programming. Another one is that the industry is growing and there's already high demand. I think that if you're a really good programmer, you're gonna have work for at least the next 20 years. If you really want it, you're gonna have work. And I think that, that will continue going forward. Now, in terms of other jobs in computer science, I think when you're in computer science and you're looking at what field you wanna go into, you should treat it almost like you're investing. 
right? You're trying to predict where there's going to be the most growth and the most opportunity in the future. You don't want to spend your time learning and studying antiquated technology, technology that's not going to be around for the next five to 10 years. So if you're looking at what platforms you want to spend your time getting really good at, Salesforce is one of them. You could be a Salesforce developer and there's high demand for that because a lot of companies are using Salesforce and they need people that know how to use this system and know how to develop on top of it. So they have certain certifications, they have certain jobs, and you can get really good at developing on Salesforce or using their API to integrate things into it. If you know how to do that, you can be in a really advantageous situation when applying for different companies. They will pick somebody that knows how to do that over somebody that just has broad programming knowledge. You also wanna learn technologies with development that are growing technologies. I went into more of the web development route because I thought that the web was where most of the technology growth is gonna be. On the front end, on the web, all these different applications, and that turned out to be a pretty good judgment. I haven't had any problem finding work in that. So I would just look at it as an investment standpoint where is there gonna be the most growth? What applications and programs and type of things can you spend your time on that are really growing rapidly? I think there's a lot of different things to pick within the computer science industry, that whole field, and you should just pick which one you think has the most growth. Okay, well, on that question, I'm gonna end this episode there. Be sure to subscribe to my secondary channel, Joseph Carlson After Hours. I'll put a link in the description of this video and I'll pin a comment with it. So if you want more free Joseph Carlson content, you can check out that secondary channel.